So my husband is not here today, so you know what that means? I get to tell stories about him. <laughs> In my house, um, I have a saying, I might be the only one who says it, but nothing is lost until I say it's lost. Recently, my husband put aside some work pants for my son, and the day before my son was going to come and visit, he was looking frantically for this bag of pants. And so he's looking up in the bedroom and in the office, and he goes down into the storage area, and he's quite bewildered because he can't find these pants anywhere. So finally, I offer to help. And the first place I go to is his clothing closet. And I open up the doors, and I look down on the floor, and there's a bag, and it's filled with pants. And on the top of the pants, there's this white piece of paper, and in bold black letters, it says, Pants for Nick. <laughs> and I, I couldn't stop laughing. I just said to him, you know this is going to end up in a sermon sometime, right? <laughs> it was right there, and yet he couldn't see what was right in front of him. I'll give you another story. Last summer, we were up at Egmont, and, which is just on the Sunshine Coast, and we stayed in this tiny little cabin, and in this little cabin was the tiniest of bathrooms. And I'm not exaggerating when I said, like, there's a sink, and there was literally two inches of counter all around this sink. So I go in in the morning, and the only thing that is on the counter is his toothbrush. It's lying down. But I need to put a few things on the counter, so I pick up his toothbrush, and I stand it up so that I can put a few things on the counter. When I'm done, I take my things and I exit, only leaving his toothbrush on the counter. He goes in, the door's shut. I hear him say, hey, do you know where my toothbrush is? <laughs> and I said, well, it, it's there. No, it's not here. It's, I know I put it on the counter, but it is not here. And I said, well, keep looking. <laughs> And after about 20 seconds or so, he embarrassedly, you know, I can hear him say through the door, oh, okay, I found it. Why couldn't my husband find his toothbrush? <laughs> you ruined my punchline, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I moved it, but I moved it, you know, he was looking for it, and he was looking for it lying down on the counter, right? He was looking it for it in the context that he knew what it looked like, he knew where it was. He was not expecting it to be standing up, right? And so he couldn't find his toothbrush because he wasn't expecting it. He wasn't expecting to see it in any other way than the way he was certain it would be. Today we're going to start a new sermon series, and you should see on the slide above me, um, that's our very own Shane there, and uh, the sermon series is called, But the Bible Says. And there are certain things, as Christian believers, that we believe in that allow us to worship um, God together. And one of those things is our belief in who Jesus is. And so that's why we can come together with people from other denominations and we can worship with them. But then there's other religious groups uh, who are wonderful people, but they don't believe the same thing about Jesus. They, they believe that the Father had created Jesus, that he's a created being. He's not as divine as Jesus. And so, our belief in who Jesus Christ is, is of primary importance for us as Christians. But, there are other doctrines in the scriptures, what we refer to as doctrines of secondary importance. And these doctrines, depending on how you believe in them, you know, they might affect how you practically live out your Christian faith, or, or what church you choose to fellowship in but they don't affect your salvation. And so in this series, we are going to have a look at what the Bible says on topics such as 
heaven and hell and creation and Jesus' return and women in church leadership. And we have a special speaker, a guest speaker coming in on November 3rd to talk about that. Since the beginning of the church, devout believers and scholars have had different interpretations of these doctrines. Now, some of you might hear some of the t topics I've just listed and, and go kind of, what is she talking about? You know, the, the scriptures only give one way to think about some of those topics. But we say that because we're like my husband who's looking for his toothbrush, right? Perhaps we've only ever heard one interpretation of certain doctrines. Or we've been in our, our denomination for our entire life and we're not aware that there are scholars since the beginning of, of the Christian church who have had different opinions on these issues and still do. And so we may possess uh, a certainty about some of these doctrines of secondary importance, but only because we've only looked at them in one certain way. Now, this isn't going to be a sermon series on apologetics where I'm going to tell you what you should believe. I'm going to present a variety of, of thoughts on each of these doctrines that Christians believe in. And some of my biases are going to come through. I'm not going to apologize for that. Also, with, with some of these topics, I'm not even sure exactly what view I adhere to. But this is something that we're going to take and we're going to learn together. You know, we're told that we are to study the scriptures ourselves. But even more importantly, this is something that we're supposed to do together. In Acts chapter 17, we're told that the Apostle Paul goes and he is teaching the Bereans. And it's said that they enthusiastically received everything that Paul had to say to them. But then they went home and they checked the scriptures for themselves to make sure that Paul was teaching them correctly. Now, Paul was probably, you know, talking about issues of primary importance, doctrines of primary importance. But you know what? The same goes with secondary issues. This is something that we need to study for ourselves, something that we need to study together. And some of you are going to have different opinions on these things. For some, you're not really going to care about particular topics. So, for example, when it comes to creation, there might be people in this room who go, you know what, it doesn't matter to me if God created the earth in six literal days or six billion years or he used the evolutionary process. All I care about is that we all agree that God is doing the creating. And then there's going to be others who passionately care about one particular view on that doctrine, and that is fine. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, let's learn together. Know why you know you believe in something. And be open to learning about what other good Christians also believe. And we're going to be ordering some books on a variety of views for the Resource Center. So that's going to help you in your research. We're not always just to leave it to other people to tell us what to believe. And the important thing to know is that on these secondary issues, even if we don't agree on them, this doesn't prevent us from fellowshipping together. Just like countless Christians before us, we are going to agree to disagree on some of these secondary issues, and we're going to continue to love each other. So because we're talking about the Bible, it's probably good if we open our Bibles. So I'm going to get you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> All scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of God, the scriptures, are God-breathed. What does that mean? 
It means that they're divine in origin. That they reflect the character of God. God breathed into them. And they became alive and active. And their purpose is to aid us in our transformation as we become more and more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. What it doesn't mean that the scriptures are God-breathed is that God used the writers and the authors of the Bible like a typewriter. You know, I'm going to, not that they had typewriters back then, but you know, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say and you're just going to type it out. I'm going to dictate and you're going to write it out for me. The Bible is both human and divine. It's human because the human writers, and as far as we know, they're all men, so I'll use he, they all wrote the Bible, but they were influenced by their language and their culture and the time that it was written in. But the scriptures are also divine because as Christians, we believe that through God's words, They work in people's lives. Back when the readers of the original readers of the text and also for us today. How many of you are puzzle lovers? Oh good, yeah. See, my husband's gone. Every time he's gone for a few days, uh, clear the kitchen table, do a puzzle. And probably like a lot of you, I dump all the pieces and I just start turning the pieces over. And when I first look at them, they're kind of meaningless to me. But as I start to work on the puzzle, I start to see the big picture, right? And I start to know where the pieces go. I start to understand the context of how everything fits. And if you're a puzzle lover, there's that moment where you can see a little piece of puzzle, and there's a tiny little slice of turquoise. Oh, it feels so good. You grab it because you know exactly where it goes. Because over here in the puzzle, there's another place with a tiny piece of turquoise, and you just snap it in, right? If you're a puzzle lover, you know what that feels like. Well, it's the same with the Bible, right? It's why it's so important to study all of the Bible, including the Old Testament, including the minor prophets. Because to understand what God is trying to say to us through his word, we need to study the entire story of God's interaction with humanity, right? Devotional readings are great. Nothing better than taking a few verses or a short passage and reading them and inviting God to speak to you, to connect with Jesus over these few verses. But we also need to look at the scriptures and read them all for learning and understanding. So when you're in the book of Habakkuk, you see that little piece of turquoise and you go, oh, 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 I know. I read something just like that in the book of John. And you read the whole thing and you start to understand how it fits together. And if you're studying particular doctrines of secondary importance, you get fed by the entire scriptures and not just a few verses. So as we look at these topics over the next little while, there's many things to consider, but we are going to consider two uh, things definitely. And the first is genre. God communicates to us through the scriptures, and he uses all sorts of writings in his communication, right? There's narratives, so they're like true stories. Uh, There's parables that are used to teach us. There's letters. Uh, There's proverbs and songs and apocalyptic writing. So as we are looking at the different verses in the text, we're going to ask ourselves, what kind of writing is this? The other thing we're going to look at is the original intent of the authors who wrote each of the passages, right? Because they wrote their books, but they were structured in such a way to teach the people they were writing to. There's theological teaching in every single book. Let me give you some examples. So the book of Judges. The author of the book of Judges has taken 12 judges and he tells their stories, but it's not necessarily in chronological order, okay? If you read the book of Judges, all the really godly judges are at the beginning. 
And as you continue on, whew, they get worse and worse. And at the end of Judges, the stories are so horrific. They're, they're some of the worst stories in the Bible. So why does the author include these stories? You know, why has he arranged the stories of these judges in this way? Because he has a theological point that he wants his readers to understand. And that's that there was a downward spiral of Israel as they became more unfaithful to God. And that included the judges. Or we have the four Gospels. Why do we have four different accounts of the life of Jesus here on this earth? It's not because it's four like news accounts, right? It's because each of the authors, they had a different group of people that they were writing to. And also, each book has theological intent behind it. When John was writing the book of John, you'll notice that there's all these light and darkness references. That's one of his main teaching points. And the other gospel writers have done the same thing. So in these accounts, we look, what is the author trying to tell us? What about Paul's letters? If you received a letter that had been postmarked for Cambodia, but it accidentally came to Canada, would you open it up and go, hey, this letter's for me? Even though it's in a different language, meant for different people, and you would read it and go, I need to do everything that this person is telling me to do in this letter. Well, that's the human part of the letter. Who's ever writing to this person in Cambodia has good things to tell them, wise things to say. But some of those things in that letter are for the people whom the letter is supposed to go to. But the divine part of the letters is that we now, in our day, and in Canada, we can read those letters and go, wow, there's wisdom here for us too. God in his divine inspired, God-breathed scriptures teaches us as well. One last example. I think in this series we're all, including myself, going to learn things that really surprise us. And I'll share one story with you um, that happened to me in seminary. We were studying the Old Testament, we were looking at the book of Job, and my seminary professor shared with us some ancient texts that basically were the same story that we find in the book of Job. But here's the key. They were older than the biblical account. And as I'm processing this, I'm like, what do you mean? Because if that's true, that means the biblical author copied the story from another culture of that time. And that just kind of blew my mind. I'm like, I always thought this story was true. It's in the Bible. Well, what has happened is the biblical author has taken a very good story and wrote it for the people he intended to teach them something about God and how God is there with us in our suffering. That was his theological intent. Now, if you remember everything, anything from this message, this is one thing I want you to remember. I really don't want you to think that I am saying that the Bible is not true or not authoritative. It is God-breathed, divinely inspired for everything we need in this moment to live Christian lives, but to interpret it properly, we have to look at the genre. And we also have to look at what the authors are trying to teach us. You know, we like to be certain about what we believe. And there's this word that gets thrown around a lot in Christian circles, especially when people have differing opinions in us. It's a word that Christians have been using against other Christians, actually, since the beginning of the church. Do you know what that word is? Heresy. That's right. I want to share with you a few of the heresies that have happened in the church over the last 2,000 years. But these ones, these are ones that people 
called heresies. So in the New Testament, we read about baptism, right? People there were baptized by full immersion. But after the first hundred years of the Christian church, not long after that, for over a thousand years, do you know how the church primarily baptized people? They sprinkled them. And usually when there were babies. In the 1500s, the Anabaptists were studying the scriptures and they said, you know what? We really believe that people should get baptized when they're old enough to make that decision for themselves. And you know what? We, we should fully immerse them because that's the example that we see in the New Testament. And do you know what the other Christians in the church did to them? They said, fine. If you want full immersion, we're going to give you full immersion. And they drowned them for this heresy. Another example, around the same time, 1500s, William Tyndale. He was an English priest, and he was very good at languages. He could speak seven different languages, plus ancient Greek and Hebrew. And he was working on translating the Bible from these ancient languages into English. And he had to go over to Germany and do it. He had to smuggle the Bible into England. And when King Henry VIII and the church leaders saw this Bible, you know what they said? This is not the testament of the Christ, but of the Antichrist. Now, it probably didn't help that William Tyndale also was opposing King Henry VIII's desire to annul uh, his marriage so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. So there was some politics involved in there as well. But they called him a heretic, and they stripped him of his priestly duties, they strangled him to death, and they burned him at the stake. And you know, eventually, his translations went on to produce the first English Bible, the King James Version. Last example. After the time of Luther and the Reformation, if you were a Protestant, you were considered a heretic by the Catholic Church. Now these three examples, none of them are heresies today, are they? We understand that other churches do different modes of baptism. We love our English Bibles, and our Korean Bibles, and Portuguese, and Romanian. There's, there's nothing better than reading the Bible in your own first language. And today, Protestants and Catholics, we work together. We might do some things differently, but we serve the same Jesus, and we worship him together. Now, heresy is a real thing. Heresy is when an opinion is different than what we believe uh, in Orthodox Christianity. And so in 2,000 years of history, there has been some real heresies. And I'm just going to give you a few, but they kind of give an overall arch to the main heresies through church history. The first is that people believe that Jesus um, was divine, but he wasn't human. So he didn't really suffer a physical death on the cross. Next, we have the opposite, that Jesus was human, but he wasn't divine. Or the one we already talked about, that Jesus is divine, but not as divine as the Father, right? He's the Son of God created by the Father. Next, we have the heresy that it is good works that get us into heaven, not any faith in Jesus. And another big one that has gone you know, throughout the ages is, is something called Gnosticism. And they believe that Jesus was just a special messenger. He had special knowledge. And so if you were a Christian that had this special knowledge, that's what saved you. It wasn't the saving work of Jesus. And what I want you to notice is about all these heresies that truly are heresies, what are they about? Right, they're all about who Jesus is and his work, his saving work on the cross. All these issues on primary importance. Over 2,000 years, the real heresies of the church haven't been about secondary issues. And the desire to be certain about what we believe has led to fundamentalism. 
and I'm going to give you the briefest history ever. You're going to have to do your own research if you want to know more about it. We're going to have a quick look at 19th and 20th century fundamentalism that basically is in a North American context, especially in the USA. So if you go back to the mid-19th century, there was two things. The first was higher criticism of the Bible. It came out of Germany. And so scholars, Christian and otherwise, were really picking apart the Bible and challenging it. And they were saying things like, there are no miracles, and other things that they were critiquing. The second thing was, was Charles uh, Darwin's Origin of the Species came out. And so Christians at that time really felt that both these things were challenging the authority of the Bible. Now we come to the late 19th century, and mass immigration was coming to North America. People were coming from non-English speaking countries, and many of them were Catholic. And these Catholics were coming and they drank alcohol, and they danced. And they did things that were different than the Protestant church in North America. And so along with other people of other faith groups, a religious pluralism entered into North America. So to defend the faith, biblical inerrancy became the cornerstone of North American Protestantism. Between 1878 and 1906, Every single Protestant denomination had a trial for heresy. It usually involves some seminary professor. Then we get to World War I. We're at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was a time when the American people became united against a common enemy. It was at this time that religion and patriotism and politics became intertwined. And it's that way to this day. And so people became bonded over things that they were against, right? Against communism and socialism and evolution. And they became bonded with things that they were for. Prohibition, conservative morality, dispensational premillennialism. How's that for a word? We're going to talk about that when we get to talking about Jesus' return, book of Revelation. But I grew up on dispensationalism. That's all I knew. I was taught it as a child. And then I remember very distinctly when I was 19, opening up the Bible and reading through it and going to my pastor and going, where is this stuff? But I was taught it as the truth. Uh, the evangelist, Billy Sunday, big American uh, evangelist, said that Christianity and patriotism are synonymous, just like hell and traitors are synonymous. And all this brought, apart, brought about the great fundamentalist modern controversy of the 1920s. We're going to talk about that more. But what it really is, is it was based in fear, right? If we don't know exactly what we believe, how are we going to defend the faith? If, if we don't know exactly what we're going to believe, how do we know how to live? Fundamentalism arose so that we could each have a checklist of exactly what to believe and how to live. Then we get to the mid 20th century and the fundamentalists separated from the rest of the evangelicals. Evangelicalism is basically a broad movement and people and churches belong to it um, if there's belief in two things. The first is that the Bible is authoritative. And the second is this belief that we are saved through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ, and that it is the Holy Spirit who transforms us. But in the mid 20th century, people started studying the Bible and they started to think differently about certain doctrines. But this wasn't anything new. This has been going on for 2,000 years. But when you were in the era of fundamentalism, which said this is how you believe on every single thing, this was a bit shocking for people. 
And so the fundamentalists decided, well, we're going to pull out. We're going to separate from the evangelicals. Even take somebody like Billy Graham, right? I think most of us would say that he is probably the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. But the fundamentalists denounced him. You know why? Because he chose to be inclusive. He chose to work with other Christian groups that didn't check off every single box on the checklist. And so in the 40s and the 50s, the fundamentalists separated from general evangelical groups. Fundamentalism is about certainty. We can be certain about all doctrine. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. But fundamentalism leads to exclusivity, right? If you don't believe in X, Y, Z, then you don't belong. And that's one of the dangers about fundamentalism. I'm sure each one of us in this room knows somebody who said, you know what? I really struggle with this aspect of doctrine of, of secondary importance. But if my church is saying, I must believe this to be a Christian, then maybe I'm not a Christian. And they walk away. Fundamentalism is actually easier than struggling with biblical interpretation, right? Here you go. This is what you should believe. And it's also based in fear because we want to understand God, right? We want the exact right interpretation from the Bible so we know exactly what to do so that we can be right with God. And so here's the thing now that we come to the year 2019. Even though fundamentalist churches have separated off from most of the evangelical churches, there are still threads of fundamentalism within most of our North American churches. But the good news is that we are becoming more and more ecumenical. Another big word, which just means that we're willing to work with other churches in the Christian faith. I remember when I grew up, I'm sorry, if you weren't a Baptist, you weren't going to heaven. And now, I'm part of a Tri-City Pastors group that has Lutherans and Presbyterians and Anglicans and Catholics. And we all come together and worship God together and see how we can serve God together in our city. Final thought. If you read through Paul's letters and epistles... What's one thing that he's always encouraging us as a church to do? Unity, right? Unity, unity, unity. The Bible is not an instructional, instructional man, manual for the Christian life with a list of everything we can be certain about, right? It's a story of God's history with his people. It's a wisdom book. It's not a step-by-step -step manual. We have to remember that we are not each other's enemies. The enemy is the evil one. So we're to have unity over the things of primary importance. Who Jesus is and God's mercy and grace to us that save us. And when we come to issues such as baptism and hell, and Jesus' return, and roles in the church. Well, we are called to give grace to each other, to serve each other, to work with each other, and to love each other.